Yeah, yeah. Trying to think of it. Hi. Live, live, live. We are live. How come we're so dark now? My name's Joseph. <laughs> Your name is Joseph. Okay, good morning, everybody. This is Jake Leachko, and that was Joseph. And we are dark. It's, uh, I don't know why the background is like this, but anyway, we appear dark today. Okay. Uh, While well, it's getting darker, it's October 3, 2017. It's getting darker, it's getting colder. So I guess um, even our background is, cold, is, is darker now. Okay, let us read the gospel for today. The gospel comes from St. Luke <coughs> chapter 9, verses 51 to 56. Yeah, okay. You ready, Chevelle? <laughs> okay. When the days for Jesus to be taken up were fulfilled, he resolutely determined to journey to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On the way, they entered a Samaritan village to prepare for his reception there, but they would not welcome him because the destination of his journey was Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they journeyed to another village. Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? These are the brothers, James and John. The sons of thunder, eh? as they were called. That was their nickname. Eh? Maybe they were called the sons of thunder because they were, they were so uh, zealous. They were so uh, full of uh, energy. They wanted to burn the town because the people there didn't want to welcome uh, Jesus. Eh? They were perhaps thinking to themselves, How dare you not welcome our master right? when he is... Uh, he is the Messiah. How, how dare you not be able to recognize uh, the Son of God? Right? So, <laughs> so uh, but Jesus perhaps just turned to them and said, Hey kids, be patient. You know? This is not the way we're going to convert the world. Okay? We're not going to convert the world by, by being intolerant of their, uh, of their lack of understanding. Eh? We should be the ones extending understanding uh, to these people. But you see, uh, James and John, among the 12 apostles, there were 12, right? So James and John uh, were of this type. They were ambitious. They were thunderous. They were energetic. They were intolerant, right? Ambitious because they even asked their mother, you know, uh, talk to Jesus so that uh, we can sit on his right hand, on his left hand in the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> so, but you see, the other apostles had their own uh, defects too. Not only James and John uh, were, were imperfect or defective uh, or had personality quirks that uh, you might think are not so becoming of apostles. See? Even the chief of the apostles, the head of the apostles, who later on became the first pope, right? St. Peter had his own uh, character quirks, which were not uh, really, you know, the best, uh, the best way you... Uh, I'm, I'm moving this because I'm seeing my shadow. <laughs> it might be distracting on the video. Anyway, um, Peter was a coward. St. Peter, for all of his bravado and for all of his uh, machismo, right, he ended up to be a coward. He denied Jesus three times. When, when push came to shove, right, when he was being uh, asked whether he knew the master, he denied him three times at that precise point and moment when he could have asserted, he could have asserted uh, his, uh, his faith in Jesus Christ. <laughs> Sorry, folks, I'm moving this video because uh, I'm seeing shadows on the, 
a background and it, uh, it's a, a little disturbing. Okay, and there was Thomas. Thomas was the other apostle, right? What was the defect of Thomas? He was doubting. He was doubtful, right? He did not trust Jesus. He didn't have faith. When Jesus resurrected and the apostles told him, well, we found the, the Messiah was with us. He was here. Oh, oh really? <laughs> Until I see the print of the nails in his hands, etc., etc., I will not believe. Right? Now, who else? Who else do you know had, uh, had uh, uh, been depicted with some defects? See? The apostles. Who huh? was the one that walked the water? Well, St. Peter, yeah. Of course, yeah, Peter. And he lacked faith, right? <coughs> Who? Matthew. Matthew, we just talked about... No, what about Matthew? Oh, that's Nathaniel. That's Nathaniel. When he, when he was... Oh, Nathaniel was so self-assured, right? He was so, you know... Uh, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, our, <laughs> But our Lord praised him. He said, well, this is a man who is without guile. See? This is a man who, is, who speaks his mind. He's not afraid. See? Well, that was actually a good trait. Right? But there was also Philip. I mean, sorry. <coughs> Philip. <coughs> right? There was, there was Philip. Well, of course, Judas. Yeah, but there's also Philip. What was the, what was the defect of Philip? I don't know. You don't know. Philip seems to be very dense. The kind of character what that uh, that the nothing ha nothing penetrates much, right? Maybe he was not the smartest among them, because after after being with Jesus for three years, and after Jesus has already been telling them, "I and the Father am one," you know, whoever sees me sees the Father. Philip still asks him, "Lord, show us the Father, and maybe we will believe." <laughs> or words to that effect, right? So Jesus says, Philip, have I been with you this long and you still do not understand that whoever sees me sees the Father, that I and the Father are one? Of course, he was talking about the Blessed Trinity, which is not, of course, very easy to understand, right? But Philip must have said, uh, duh, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so you can see that the apostles were not the most perfect of people, of personalities, and of, uh, of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, companions that Jesus could have had, right? Uh, they were not the, the most perfect ones. But you see, Jesus chose them. Jesus chose them because he wanted to use them as instruments. He wanted to act on them. And he wanted to make us now understand that to become saints, to become perfect, as he called us to perfection... When he said, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Perfection in sanctity is not a question of having all the virtues and being so good and, and without mistakes and without blemish. No, that is not sanctity. That is not the kind of sanctity that Christ called us to live. He knows we are imperfect. He knows that we are all stained by original sin. He knows we all have defects, yet He calls us to be what? To be perfect as your <coughs> Heavenly Father is perfect. How should we understand that kind of perfection? How should we understand that call to perfection? What is the standard for perfection? Eh? What is the standard? Huh? Perfection. Yeah, what is it? What does it mean? Yeah, but what does that mean? What does being per have you ever seen perfection? No. No. And I don't think we will ever see it, right? Because perfection is an ideal whose standard just keeps going higher and higher and higher and higher. Every time you reach a certain stage in your life where you think you are very good already, right? Well, you don't stop there. Because you know what? When you stop there, there's no other way but down. See? Down. Perfection means always trying to exceed the last level of achievement that you were able to attain. 
See? That's what perfection is all about. Because people are not perfect. We are not perfect, but we are perfectible. Okay? That is the big difference. And that is the, that is the key word. We are not perfect, but we are perfectible. Meaning, meaning that we can always rise up to the next level. And go above, above the previous level. And go higher. And challenge ourselves more. And push ourselves more. To be better, 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 and better. And as Matthew Kelly often wants to say, we can always try to be the better version of ourselves. Or the best version of ourselves. Right? That's the way Matthew Kelly puts it. Okay? I would say, I would say, well, we can always be the more perfectible version of ourselves. Okay? Because we are not perfect, but we are perfectible. Meaning, we can always aim higher, higher, higher. And that is, that is the essence, I'd like to think, of what Jesus says. You've got to be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. right? Because God's perfection is, well, unattainable for us. It's really... It's really uh, God is the all perfect being, creator and Lord of heaven and earth. In, in fact, we don't even know what that kind of perfection uh, means because we cannot know God fully, right? Uh, because of our own limited intellect. But we know, we know ourselves and we know that we can push ourselves to higher levels each and every time we achieve some level of perfectibility. Okay? And here is where I'd like to introduce, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, a very important Catholic practice okay? to help us attain that level of perfectibility uh, one step at a time, higher and higher every time. Okay? Why are you raising your hand, Joe? Question. What is your question? Okay, we'll answer the, the question of Joseph. Is the Blessed Mother perfect? Well, as far as human standards are concerned, yes, she is perfect because she doesn't have sin. Eh? She does not have sin. Eh? And yes, that's true. So she is one very good standard for us to emulate eh? the kind of perfection of Our Lady. Eh? She was full of grace and she had no sin. So yes, you can say that Our Lady, among all human creatures, is perhaps the most perfect. Eh? So anyway, what what... A Catholic practice okay, can we do every day of our lives to help us attain perfectibility it's called the examination of conscience okay? the examination of conscience it is a time a moment of the day when we can look into ourselves and go deeper into understanding ourselves and ask well what can I improve on today? Where can I get better? What can I do better tomorrow? What wrong things did I do today? The same thing we do at night, right? Every evening, when we, before we go to bed, it, it's a habit in our own family where we gather in the uh, family room and we pray our evening prayers. But before that, we uh, do the examination of conscience where we ask ourselves basically three questions. First question is, what are the good things I did today? Good things. So examination of conscience, when we examine ourselves, it's not only a question of examining the wrong things we do. We also have to understand the good things that we do. Okay? There has to be a balance between understanding our good and bad behaviors, our virtues and our vices. And because it is that way that we improve ourselves. We improve the good things and we try to eradicate or overcome the bad things. See? with some amount of struggle that we uh, have to employ every day. So during the examination of conscience, we ask ourselves, what are the good things I did today? And we spend a minute or two looking into ourselves, praying to God and the Holy Spirit and asking the Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds and our consciences to help us understand what good things we did that day. Right? And we will come up with some answers. Right? We'll come up with some answers. Then after that, we ask ourselves, 
what are the bad things I did today? And there is where all of our vices, all of our lack of charity, all of the bad behavior, the laziness, the uh, um, whatever have you, the bad word you said to, to your neighbor, uh, the sloppy work you did at, the, at work, or uh, whatever it is, would come to light. And there is where uh, we will have uh, fodder for uh, contrition, repentance for the bad things we did that day. And then there's a third question we ask ourselves, and that is, what are the good things we did today, excuse me, which we could have done better, and which we can try to do better tomorrow? Okay? So the following day, we'll pinpoint one or two things, and I'd recommend just stick to one. One thing that you can improve on the following day. Is it perhaps uh, making better use of your time? so that you can achieve more the following day? Could it be uh, smiling a little bit more so that you can uh, brighten up uh, your environment and the environment of people around you? Is it, uh, is it going to be uh, trying to work uh, a little bit more intensely eh? so that uh, you, can, you can achieve uh, more things that day? Is it uh, trying to be kinder to your neighbors, your brothers and sisters? Eh? Is it to try and, uh, and avoid uh, having critical thoughts uh, and, and uh, being too critical about your neighbors? Eh? There are many things. And, and, and we will all know what those things are that relate to our own personal personalities or own characters that we can improve on. Eh? So we can look into those things every day. And that's a good habit. Every night, every evening, before you go to bed, it's good to examine yourselves. Now, there are two, there are actually two kinds of examinations of conscience. One would be that, it's called the general examination of conscience at the end of the day. But there is also the other kind which is called the particular examination of conscience. The particular examination of conscience is where we uh, focus on one very, very concrete point of character that is really Many times it's the dominant point that, uh, that hunts us uh, and, and that, uh, that is uh, like a thorn on the side, uh, like St. Paul describes, right? the thorn on his side that he could not get rid of. Right? It's the pain in the, the neck or whatever pain you want to call it. <laughs> that is always there. It's always there. And it's a very difficult a virtue to gain or a very difficult vice or behavioral defect to overcome. It's always there. And many times that is, that is what defines our character, <laughs> that particular defect. Right? That is what we become known for as far as defects are concerned. Right? And it can be sometimes you know, our being uh, hot-tempered or our being uh, uh, intolerant of the, uh, uh, of the uh, defects of others, you know, like uh, James and John here, right? So intolerant about uh, 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 other people. Or it can be the cowardice of Peter, you know, uh, or it can be the uh, uh, doubts of Thomas, uh, or whatever it is. But uh, there's always something that uh, is so hard for us to get rid of or a virtue that is so hard for us to acquire. That can be the material for our particular examination of conscience. That stickling point that we want to uh, work on time and time again until, until we get to a point, we get to a point where we can uh, tell ourselves that, yeah, you know, I've been able to overcome that defect. I think I'm more patient now than I used to be a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. I'm more understanding now. I'm kinder now in my words. Or, so until that point comes, we keep working on that singular uh, vice or virtue that can help us really be more on the road to sanctity. Okay? And examination of conscience is the good practice, the good Catholic practice we can use to help us along this path. And speaking of sanctity, speaking of vice and virtue, you know, when somebody is declared a saint, okay, the declaration of sanctity of, of uh, the church, when somebody, when the church declares 
a person to be a model of sanctity? What does the church, uh, how does the church declare one to become a saint? The terminology used is, it's not that this guy was perfect. It's not that this saint so-and-so uh, is a perfect Catholic. No. What the church says is that this person we are presenting to you today as a model for sanctity for you is someone who has lived the virtues to a heroic degree. Living the virtues to a heroic degree. That is what sanctity is all about. And the church declares it so. The, chair, the church declares somebody to become a saint or to be a saint and a model for all of us to become saints by declaring that he or she lived the virtues to a heroic degree. Not to a perfect degree, but to a heroic degree. Because that is what perfectibility is all about. Right? We are not perfect, but we are perfectible. And we can be perfectible by working on our virtues in, in a heroic manner. By trying to live the virtues in a heroic degree. And if we do that, we'll be on the road to sanctity. And hopefully, the church might just recognize it. But whether or not the church recognizes it, that's a secondary matter. That's a bonus. What's important is whether God recognizes our heroic efforts or not. So let's show God that we want to become saints. That we're going to do it in a heroic manner. That's it for us, folks. Have a good day, everybody. Till tomorrow again. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Take care.